If you're a big JavaScript nerd, you've almost certainly seen this benchmark floating around. If you look at it closely, you'll see Next is really slow. Like, really slow. Like, why would anyone ever use this slow? So obviously, this went viral, and everybody has strong opinions about it, myself included. What you might not have guessed is that Ryan Carniato and I are on the same side here. But this benchmark doesn't necessarily mean much. And when I, the guy who pushes React really hard, and Ryan, the guy who made the fastest framework right now, both agree and also perform poorly on this solution, like, Neither of us have good numbers here, but that's fine because the thing this is measuring doesn't really matter that much. In fact, the vanilla React example doesn't even spit out valid HTML. So what are we actually benchmarking here? Great question. Let's dive straight in. This originally was surfaced by Adam Rackus because he saw Dax playing with it. And the numbers that are here don't look great. If you just read this for what it is, React in the time frame, which I think was 10 seconds, was able to do 537 ops per second. Sorry, so it's 5,300 total. So 537 pages rendered per second, but Next can only do 41. So this is for when a request is made to the server, how quickly the page can be generated by said server and sent to the user. So this is obviously really important, right? Like all Next does is generate pages on the server. Shouldn't it be really fast at this? Eh. I have a few things I want to emphasize here because this is this is an interesting problem. I don't think this benchmark matters a whole lot. And I have a lot of things I can show to show why. I should have probably scripted an order of events here, but that takes way too much effort and thought to do. So instead, I'm just going to show you guys some of the cool things I have found as I have been testing this myself, researching it, getting changes made to the benchmark library this is all based on. And we'll dig in. Stick around to the end if you want to see better benchmarks that more realistically represent production workloads, because I've been working heavily on those too. But first, I want to look at what others have done as a result of this. First off, I got accused for dodging things. Somebody said, uh, you've been shown the code, what now? When I was literally at a conference. So I just, I found that hilarious that just because I've been shown the code that I'm immediately expected to respond and defend every single thing. This is a nuanced thing that's going to take a long video. Look at the bottom to see how long this video is. It's absurd because this is a complex problem. Server-side rendering pages on requests is difficult. But importantly, the speed of the rendering is not the thing slowing you down. If we had a spectrum of the things that make your render performance slow, we could say like, this is vanilla React. Let's say React. So React's rendering time takes that long. And then next JS rendering takes, it said 14 times longer, right? That long. The harsh reality is that the actual time this takes to like do everything it would need to do, like if you have a database query and all these other things, is gonna look more like that. <laughs> and as such, the amount of time you're spending on rendering just doesn't really matter a whole lot. And that's the point I wanna emphasize here is that while these numbers look bad, if you look at them a little tiny bit closer and you see that we're talking about nanoseconds here. It starts to matter a whole, whole lot less. But I'm not the only one saying this, to be very clear. I want to be sure that it's known that I'm not just here defending Next, because I'm sure if you look at the comments right now, it's a bunch of people saying, oh yeah, Vercel pays Theo. Of course he's going to defend it. In case anyone here somehow doesn't know, this is Ryan Carniato. He's the creator of SolidJS, which is the thing that wins all of these benchmarks almost always. You might have noticed that Solid actually isn't winning this benchmark for once. And if I go back to the benchmark itself, which you'll see here, Solid is not doing great. React is eight times slower than Marco and Solid is 10 times slower than Marco, which makes it a decent bit slower than React. But like for Solid to be performing worse than React, this should be a massive, massive red flag for the usefulness of these benchmarks. Because we all know, it's just common knowledge that Solid is significantly faster than React. So for Solid to be this much slower than React and comically slower than Marco suggests that these benchmarks aren't super valid. So what I'm trying to emphasize here is that these benchmarks are valuable, but not for individuals trying to decide what framework to use. They're valuable for the people building these frameworks, and even then, not that valuable, because the percentage of your time and your compute spent doing the render on the server to generate HTML is so small that even 50xing it isn't that big of a deal. And that's the thing I really want to emphasize is that this number is such a small percentage of your runtime cost that even the fastest framework doesn't optimize for it. So let's hear what Ryan has to say, because he is he is the wizard of JS performance. There is nobody I would trust more about this than him. And he he put this much better than I possibly could have. Let's talk about benchmarking for a minute, because I feel like it's a topic. I, it's funny enough, my stream on benchmarking is probably my least popular stream to date. He did touch on something there I want to, to riff on a bit. There's a couple of these topics that feel like everyone cares a lot about them because they bring them up on Twitter all the time. Those include things like lock-in, like... Uh, 
unexpectedly really high bills and now benchmarks, which is sad to see benchmarks fall into this space. I am frustrated because I don't feel like these things come up as real critiques, even though all of them are real problems. I feel like these things come up when somebody doesn't want to use something and they're looking for an excuse to not use it. It's okay to just not use it. You can say, I just don't want to use next. That's fine. If you don't want to go use something else. But when you keep making up these different things to sound like you're making a smart decision, it's just weird. And the reason I believe this is whenever I make a video covering these topics, even if I am on the, the mob side of the thing, nobody watches them. My videos about lock-in have all bombed. My videos about the unexpected bill on Netlify, that one with the crazy bill, which was entirely unacceptable, by the way, that video bombed too. Both Ryan and my videos about benchmarking have bombed as well. Nobody actually cares about this topic. They just care as they can use it as a weapon to attack the things they don't like. This is why I am frustrated, and I believe why Ryan is frustrated too, because it seems like everybody cares about this, so we come out and explain how this actually works, and then nobody watches it. So if you're actually this far into the video and watching still, let me know in the comments, and also go check out Ryan's video about benchmarks, This it's even better than this one. I'm gonna go here because I wrote, I wrote this. This is such a good quote, by the way. Benchmarking is easy. Unintentionally cheating benchmarks is easier. Creating useful benchmarks is hard. Having those benchmarks be fair is harder. Whew. This is clearly a subtweet. The reason I wanted to bring this up or say this is because people benchmark stuff a lot. And I always hear it with Solid 2, like on the positive side where people are like, oh, I, I took this React app and I, or I took this Solid example and Solid's way faster. And it's like, yeah, I mean, the thing's not doing anything. You're seeing how fast you can update text. Obviously the thing that doesn't have to diff and literally just sets the text node is gonna be faster than pretty much any other framework out there, right? No component re-render, like even less than Svelte, you know, like, you know, this, yes. If, if, if I wrote a vanilla routine that just said, set this text, you know, as fast as possible over and over again, that'd be even faster than using the reactive system. But what I, I sometimes isn't always obvious um, is that you can make assumptions that actually cheat the benchmarks, so to speak, right? Where you do things where like unintentionally you skew, skew the results of your benchmark. Perf We're gonna show some fun examples of how that applies here in particular. I don't think you guys understand just how many hacks a framework can add in order to make those numbers look better. Usually they do it by just opting out of all of the features of the framework and having a happy path if you're doing literally nothing in order to make it so you're not even using the framework. But the reason certain frameworks are performing so well on this is they're basically not using the framework. They're just rendering the HTML and then letting the client deal with the weight after the fact. Perfect example of this was some of those early tests, uh, sorry, sorry, Aiden, um, with MillionJS comparing the performance to React and Preact. And basically there was some overhead in the benchmark that kind of skewed it. This can also happen. And I'm saying this as an investor in million.js that is very excited about what they're working on. The initial benchmarks did not really showcase the, the reality of the performance difference there. So I, yeah. I'm calling out a company that I've thrown thousands of dollars to because I think benchmarks are that important. And I think that representing things fairly is important too. Still love you, Aiden. You've gotten a lot better about this since. When I, I first entered the JS framework benchmark with Solid, I wasn't doing some things that were required and I didn't realize why and I didn't think they would make a difference. And guess what? They actually did make a difference. Um, when I implemented it initially, um, Solid was like much faster. And I was like, thought, you know, haha, I knew this would be really fast. But the reality of it, it was, you know, it wasn't nearly as fast as I thought it was because I would miss some details, right? It's very easy to make a mistake um, and kind of cheat a benchmark. I do highly recommend basically everyone watching this, if you are interested, go check out this part of the stream. I'll be sure it's time stamped in the bottom because it's really good. But there's a couple specific quotes I'm looking for here right now. I'm tired of people saying benchmarks are useless, but on the other hand, lots of benchmarks are useless. Whew, spitting fire, right? Benchmarks aren't useless. Lots of benchmarks are useless. This one, where it started, actually hugely flawed because the, at least if it's the exact, the, the, for, for multiple reasons, right? First of all, rendering a hello world, well, it depends on what you're testing. Let's see here. If you're just testing the overhead of the framework, then I guess this is fair because rendering hello world doesn't actually test how fast the framework renders, right? I'll, I'll grant it this. This original test is actually not the worst in that if you're just like, how much to start to like, if I if I had AWS and I was running AWS and I was like, uh, you know, if I take my cold start plus framework startup on a request or whatever, like wh what, what am I dealing with? Yep, this is an important point. Like this benchmark as a way for framework authors to optimize like really happy paths where we're just spitting out hello world. 
could potentially be useful to catch things like a regression. What it is not is a way to make a decision about which framework you should use, which is the thing I'm seeing that causes me to make this video now. Like, to be frank, this is something that should stay purely in Ryan Carniato's world. Like, this should not be leaking over to my channel because he's the framework guy, I'm the app guy. I'm the one who takes all the cool things he does and build really shitty slow web apps on top of it. We shouldn't be agreeing this much, but we're agreeing this much because everyone else is freaking the fuck out for reasons they don't understand. See this duplication thing? Where you notice all the ones that are times one, let me blow this up a bit so you can see it, are faster than all the ones that are times two. It's because these are the ones that are actually sending data required for hydration. Yep. Another important part here is that like the things that go really fast aren't hydrated. They're just spinning out HTML on the server. The things that have the data duplication have enough data to continue rendering on the client. Because if I just send you an HTML page, nothing can be updated. But if I send you the HTML page and some data about what was used to generate that page, then you can do further rendering. And that's just not accounted for here at all. I really like that they added this to the benchmark to make it clearer, but also shows that like in order to make view even faster, you have to make it so the client experience is fundamentally different from the server experience. These apps actually don't send the data for hydration. So you're basically doubling the payload. Basically, either you choose to to use an example that's hydratable or you choose to use an example that's not. Some of these are streaming and some of these are not, which also makes a difference too. There's an important point. I, I see people saying that the benchmark is good because people are making performance improvements off of it, which like, yeah, cool, there's performance improvements, but like how important are these improvements? I think Ryan summarizes my frustration here weirdly perfectly. You guys ship JavaScript, right? You, you, you hydrate. I, I, some people saw this like, oh, it made view two times faster in this benchmark. Well, do you think Evan would have missed a 2x gain on something that was actually useful? Thank you so much, Ryan. Do you think Evan Yu would have missed a two times improvement on something that actually mattered? Let's be real here. Anybody who thinks this benchmark is important is also saying Evan Yu and the Vue team are dumb. And I don't think that. The Ev Evan Yu and the Vue team are some of the hardest working and smartest people in the entire industry. So for them to find a 2x win here suggests that the thing that they multiplied by two is not an important number because they would have found it much earlier if it was. So yeah, this like perfectly encapsulated my frustration because people see these, these two times wins and they're like, oh my God, benchmarks are so important. They're making the web faster. No, they're letting us show off numbers that just don't matter. And it makes us feel good about ourselves, which is all this is, is people feeling good about the choices they've already made, not actual good decision-making or process. So... What's wrong with these benchmarks? Why am I so frustrated? <sighs> There's a couple things. Let's let's start breaking these down one at a time. We should probably actually look at the benchmark and what it does first. So I'm on a forked version, so we're gonna read through this code first, and then I'll go play with my fork right after. So in this version, the code's actually pretty simple, and I I have to shout out the author of this repo, EKNKC. He's killing it. Akin, this is as a framework nerd, a phenomenal benchmark of important inner working things that are fun for us to bicker about. He did not expect this to blow up the way it did. He built this for fun to be part of like the, the framework meta conversation. And if anything, he seems a little bit frustrated that it got as big as it did. And I'm sure it must be annoying having pull requests coming in from every obscure framework author trying to add their framework to the benchmark and their opinions in. It's stressful when something like this blows up the way it did. So massive shout out and respect to the author. This code base has also been really pleasant to work in. I've been using it a ton over the last few days trying to better understand what's being benchmarked here. So the big piece is that we have these handlers. The handlers are this array of things being imported or used above that spit out a request response compatible handler that you can send a request to and get a response from. This allows you to take just the handler and not testing any of the overhead of HTTP or stuff like that and just say, hey, here's the request that came from the like uh, HTTP framework. Give me back what I would then send through the HTTP framework. And it lets you just test that part. So we're not testing almost anything else to do with this like runtime. We're not testing how quickly the request is parsed, how quickly the response is generated, how quickly these things are handled by the HTTP layer. We're not testing anything to do with data, anything to do with real async. However, there is a bit of async. And here's where things start to get fun. We have in our modules, the test data call. So this test data is used in all of the things being tested, and it is returned as a promise that does a set immediate. So it does get thrown to the top of the, or well, I guess the bottom of the event loop, but it doesn't have to wait at all. It just immediately resolves. So everything else the framework does goes after immediately, and then we get to this step. But because this is async, because this returns a promise, it forces all of the handlers in all of the frameworks into async mode if they support it. So again, well-designed. This, this does make sense for what it's 
trying to test, which is what is the overhead of a very blank, empty render in, in these frameworks? So we look at the next examples to better understand how this code's actually being used. We import test data. We have the app default function that returns table where we actually await test data here. And we have the table function here where we actually render the entries. And here's the function for an entry. The important piece here is we await the data up there and then we throw it in here and we return it. Pretty simple benchmark. So these numbers look awful. I'm not gonna pretend they don't. I'm not gonna pretend seeing next and saying 14.7% slower doesn't suck. What I'm saying is it doesn't really matter. And I'll show you what I mean. I've been playing with the benchmark a bunch, changing the formatting of things a little bit, but mostly making one important change. The one change I made is in the test data module, I increased the amount of time it takes because by default, it doesn't take any time. I just bumped it to 100 milliseconds. So now the data that your service is using takes 100 milliseconds to get. That could be your fetching data from a database. That could be your authenticating the user. It could be a lot of things. And honestly, 100 milliseconds for most services is quite generous. Chances are it's going to take more than that, even just to make one network request or connect to a database. It's not that it takes 100 milliseconds to just fetch data. It's that you're doing multiple things in series, such as you're authenticating the user. And once they're authenticated, you're then fetching the data and then you're sanitizing the data and then you're sending it to the user. And if any part of that chain happens to be going through a serverless workflow that might be a cold stuff, Start, yeah, this could quickly add up. I've had services that take three to 500 milliseconds to generate the actual data that you need in order to render the page. So now that we've bumped this up to 100 milliseconds, we can take a look at the difference in the benchmark performance. And that is the only change here, to be clear. I had a random function that I was playing with to make the range different, but I found that that made the benchmark less reliable because different frameworks could regularly have different like min and maxes, to, which made it kind of unfair. So I chose to make this a fixed number for the sake of getting the most reliable data I could. The other change I made, I think this one's important too, and we're going to be playing with this even further because changes were made to the library. I added a bit of parallelism. Previously, this benchmark was testing request, 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 request. In real load, you're not getting just one request, waiting till it's resolved, and then the next request comes in right after. You're getting multiple requests at a time, and you're handling those some level of concurrency involved. This benchmark wasn't testing that at all, and at the time, the tiny bench library it was using did not support parallelism. If we go to tiny bench, though, I actually cut an issue yesterday because previously it did support concurrency and then they added sequential as the default and then they added a PR that removed the parallel options entirely. So I wanted to be able to test this with concurrency. And of course, Mohammed immediately filed a PR and got it added before I even started the stream. Legend, absolute legend. So what I was doing for concurrency before is I set this bullshit parallel limit of five and it wasn't actually parallel because like if you had five requests and the first one resolved, the sixth one wouldn't come in. It was in chunks of five. And even that I saw pretty significantly different numbers. I'll show you what those numbers look like quick. And then we're going to change this to use the actual proper concurrency mode that they just added. Actually, one other important change I made previously, they lock this on time. I found that that wasn't the most reliable thing, especially once you get into the longer runs for some of these. So I changed it to 100 iterations. So it runs these 100 times instead. I had also previously commented out a bunch of the frameworks that I just didn't think were as important for the benchmark, but I left them all in for this. I did comment out the... Uh, Recently, these were split into two sections. There is the uh, renderers and there is the frameworks, where a renderer is something like Viewer React. It's the actual JavaScript library that generates the HTML. And then the framework is the thing that hosts it on the server, so like Next or Nuxt. So they separated those so that it was clearer when you broke them up. But I just commented out the part where they run the um, one for the frameworks because I just didn't care. Yeah, here, the uh, benchmark handlers. I just commented that out because I, or the renders is what I didn't care about. So I commented that part out. I care much more about the framework side because that's where the scary numbers were. Almost done. Cool. So here we see just by adding 100 milliseconds of data fetching, we went from a 14x gap to 1.5x gap from something that doesn't hydrate the client side. I think this highlights just how not big of a deal this is. But now I want to try out the new stuff that was added quick. Once again, like huge shout out to everybody involved with this. Like none of the engineers who are involved in or contributing to this did anything wrong here at all. They actually did something pretty dope. What I'm upset about is that their work in benchmarking these like nitty gritty details for fun has been mistaken as reasons to use or not use specific solutions, which it is not. If anybody looks at these things and thinks that they're a reason to or not to use these frameworks, they're fundamentally misunderstanding the frameworks. And disable all the things I wrote for parallelism because they're stupid. Comment that out, rename this to run. 
now it will behave how it's supposed to. It should also be a lot faster if I leave that on 100 iterations. I might bump that up to 400. Cool. Oh, run concurrently. And this takes a number. We'll give it five. Oh no, is it running them all? That was not quite what I expected for run concurrently. I expected it to do five steps at a time in one of the sections. Rip. So close, but so far. I was hoping to try to do concurrent mode out, but despite the great efforts by Mohammed, there was a small bug. So we might try that later. We might not. Follow me on Twitter or even follow him on Twitter if you want updates on that. Regardless, Tiny Live has been awesome to work with and is a huge part of why this has been like viable. Again, with just that 100 millisecond penalty though and the concurrency, we're down to 1.5x slower. It's significantly less bad than everybody seems to think. Uh, the results are showing raw SSR performance without any data fetching and it doesn't account for data serialization, which is why the React code seems faster than solid because vanilla React doesn't bother serializing the data. That's handled by frameworks. This is another interesting thing I don't think people get is the idea of like how much a given tool is doing. So if we have the like full stack React experience, we'll call this. This is full stack React. The spectrum has parts. Part of the spectrum is going to be React and the other part's going to be the framework. So we could draw the line. We'll just pretend for now that it's in the middle. So I'll put this in the middle. We say on one side is React and on the other side is the framework. Next. Remix, etc. Some frameworks build more into the framework side. So if we compare this to like Solid, you'll see that like Solid does a lot more of the work. It Solid starts like a relatively small addition on top compared to something like React, where the React part of the full stack experience is actually quite small. They define the protocols and the expectations that React has, but the vast majority of the work is things the framework does. How do you get the data to React? How do you respond to the request that the React page is making? How do you stream in the pieces that the React server components use and utilize? How do you handle server actions? How do you bundle it? All of these things are problems that the framework has to solve for. And when you're just using React without that, you're not getting any of the things that we now expect with full stack React. If we look at the source code for the React example, I think you'll understand what I'm saying here because it is very, very dumb, boring, and simple. Here we import the test data. We bind a ref for it. They actually use suspense in it, which is nice at least. Then they use the uh, use hook, which is the React way of handling a promise. I've yet to get this working in almost anything. Specifically, whenever I use use on client, it bombs. So why does it work here? Well, we're not actually shipping anything to client here. That's why we're rendering this on the server. So function table returns T data, and then we get the actual table rendering. By the way, Mohammed, if you're still here, I hope you're not stressing out. Like I, I know how stressful it could be to have your work showcased in front of thousands for the first time. Don't worry about it. You're killing it. And this is awesome stuff. I'm like actually really pumped with this library. What the, why can't it, what broke? What did I change that it's, oh, is it because everything expects an array now and it's not an array anymore? Oh yeah, this is a mistake I made. Yeah, the response zero, I fucked that up, cool. This is what happens when I write vanilla JS. This is my fault entirely. Edit length error was a skill issue on my part. I, I want to try the concurrent thing again now too. Everybody loves to use the benchmarks that their tools enable to complain about shit, but nobody actually checks the benchmarks, like the tools that make them possible. Oh, look at that. When I disable the concurrency, we're actually down to 1.28 times slower for next. So like, yeah, hopefully you guys are starting to get the point here that these numbers don't actually mean too much. Oh, I killed it. I, I wanted that open though. God damn it. That was a dumb mistake on my part. I want to go to the React one. God, this is going to be so awful to edit. I feel so bad. I, I've posted the results once or twice since changing the benchmark up and people were very mad at me. So that's why I'm doing this video. So I can at least have them give them something to point at. <laughs> this is some really good HTML that we just got back. But if we go to here, cool. So here is the code we get back from the React runner. It has all that random data. What you'll notice here is that there's almost no JavaScript here at all. So all there is here is like a very minimal React like data loading bit for the suspense, and that's it. There is no other JavaScript loading, which is important because if data changes or any other things occur on this page, it does not have the necessary context to do anything with it. It doesn't even have like head. There is nothing in here other than that one script tag that is actually useful for running on the client. So it hasn't embedded any data. It hasn't done anything to the data that we have above here. It just spit out the HTML. And it does that with a very simple react dom server dot render to pipeable stream. 
That's it. This is the framework in the vanilla React example. There is no framework. It's just the pipeable stream. We don't even have the ability to run the JavaScript on the client because we're not shipping anything. This is just the generation side. Whereas with Next, if we look at what the Next code spits out, we actually first off get an HTML page because it's an actual HTML document. So huge win already. The other page wasn't even HTML because it's just piping the stream. So now we have valid HTML first and foremost. But if we go in here, you'll see we have a lot of other useful stuff. We have this script that includes a lot of things that are already here. So we have this string. If I select this, I'll command F for it. And you'll see that's an element here. So why do we have that there as well as in the JS? Isn't that like unnecessary? Why do we have all the data twice? Because it means we can update the data. It means we can get changes. It means we can process changes. It means we have the things to mount, unmount, and play with our website. It's dynamic and we have things we can do. But importantly, you see all this crazy escaping and shit? The server had to escape all of those things and put them in a format that they can be embedded. This is important additional work because it lets you navigate and actually use the page. It also enables things like prefetching. So if you have multiple routes, you can go to one and the others will load in the background. So when you go to it, it loads faster. It also means that if you need data in order to switch between those routes and render the components without having to go all the way to the server for the whole HTML, you have that. It's a really important pattern that is used in most frameworks now. In I mean that, like the only thing that doesn't do this that has good client and server behaviors, arguably is HTMX, but also there's crazy stuff going on in the quick world. I have a whole video covering that if you're curious, look for my quick two vid. But you need something to allow the client to know what data exists and what it's gonna use for those things. Astro doesn't count because Astro's not a client-side framework. Astro doesn't run JavaScript, but yes. This is a huge part that's missing, is twice the data is being included and it has to generate this in a format that actually is compatible with JavaScript and is serialized such that it's safe to send over the wire. These are not simple problems and they do a lot of work to make sure these things are good. But yes, if you're comparing this to a crappy HTML generator that isn't even valid HTML, it's gonna be slower. Absolutely, it's gonna be slower. But that's why I don't think it's a fair comparison. Cool, while that is running. One other fun thing I learned while I was doing this, these benchmarks went so viral that people were looking at benchmark.js and they finally decided to archive it. It hasn't received an update for like over six years, but just now, just a few days ago, it finally got killed. So once again, congrats slash I'm sorry to our friend Mohammed working on Tiny Bench because you went from like a nice modern option to like the standard overnight. <laughs> Congrats, good luck. I do not envy the issues you're gonna be seeing popping up constantly over the next few months. But you built something awesome, be proud of it. Cool. Look at that, once we turn on concurrency, the numbers are like hilariously close now. Like, hilariously so. <laughs> I didn't expect them to get that much closer, honestly. I'm a bit surprised. And also for, um, this is Marco, right? For, for Marco's performance to go to shit once you're running things in parallel? None of this is stuff I would have expected. So yeah, the more you make this resemble the real world, the less these benchmarks matter is the thing I've noticed quickly. Like if you throw out the real world and you're just testing this one thing and that one thing for different frameworks accounts for different stuff that you're not doing, it's gonna be an issue. Oh, MFNG is an RSC thing? Oh, my bad, didn't know that. I have no idea what that is. I guess that if that's a new server component thing, I'll definitely check that out in the future. But it seems like it does not handle the concurrent stuff as well as I would have expected. Anyways. I wanna talk about the things that we've actually seen improved as a result. We see in this JLarky tweet, framework users, micro benchmarks are useless. Framework authors, we fixed a real bug after looking at micro benchmarks. Yes, there are things framework authors can find from this, but the fact that a 2x win wasn't found until now shows how little these matter. I don't know you well enough to go read the PRs and explain them, but I do know Next well enough to read the PRs and explain them. So we're gonna take a look at the first of what will likely be a, an arc of the Next team getting nerd sniped into caring about this one. It doesn't actually matter that much. And here we see get server assert HTML has been improved as well as create head insertion transformation stream. This PR improves the server rendering performance a bit, especially in the app router. It has mainly two changes, a rough benchmark test with a 300 kilobyte lorem ipsum page and SSR is about 18% faster on it, as well as these two improvements. This is the things you're gonna notice here. This is why I don't care. The first step is that we, we avoid an extra render to readable stream if we already know the content will be empty. We avoid a stream await dot already for better parallelism with stream to string, and we increase the progressive chunk size. These are changes that arguably do not matter at all in 99.95% of apps. They're literally adding opt out things. So if we know this, we skip this path. Like here's one real optimization. We're not calling the path like generator function because it doesn't change within this loop. That's an optimization. Cool. We've now saved ourselves that check 
but also if it's the current one, we just have an escape for the slash current page. It just these are the types of like things they're doing where very specific use cases like testing the root path with really basic rendering is slightly faster now because that's what this benchmark was checking for. And we switch this uh, render server insert HTML to just be the server insert HTML object that we call above here. And we skip the step now if we know the content is empty. This is the, the big change where I'm assuming most of that performance win came from is if you're not actually inserting HTML from the server to the client, we skip this step. The whole point of using AppRouter is that you're inserting server HTML to the client. So if you're using AppRouter and you're not actually using AppRouter, here you go, it's slightly faster, cool. But this is the point. There's no need to wait for the stream to be ready, like calling a wait stream all because stream to stream will wait and decode the stream progressively with better parallelism. Cool. Another small but valuable win. They just deleted this await stream dot already because stream to string already handles that. So by deleting an await, they're stopping one another additional unnecessary check. And then Jim hops in. Another low hanging fruit there is that maybe we can just call render to string in some places where we know there won't be anything that needs to be streamed. Again, they wrote all this code in a way that it is runtime agnostic and handles all of the crazy parallel server rendering things you can do in Next. But that means if you turn off or don't use all of those features, the code that sends the response is still running that code. So for them to optimize these things, the solution is having escapes where if you're not using streaming or you're not using async stuff or you're not even using server components, that you can skip those parts. But they wrote this in a way that is runtime agnostic and feature set agnostic, which means if you're using none of Next features, yeah, it's a little bit slower than if you're not using Next. But if you're not using Next features, don't use Next. Like it's okay to not use Next. You don't have to use this framework. If you're using none of the features that make the one not really meaningful benchmark slightly slower, don't use Next. If you can reasonably write your project in HTMX and you're already familiar with it, go ahead. No one's going to talk shit. This isn't comparing that type of thing, though. This is the features that Next enables, the server component behaviors that Next introduces that allow your performance to be significantly better than it was for your users. Very important. That's what's so cool about this. But these changes aren't really important and are going to take a lot of time. As Shooting says here, this would require a large change, but it's definitely worth it. But it's currently blocked by their Edge React server not having rendered a string exported. Again, if they want React to run in these other environments like the Edge, like Cloudflare workers, these functions don't always work the same way on all of these platforms. And what they built here is a solution that works on all of these platforms. So could Shu go refactor a bunch of the code to make this benchmark slightly faster and also keep it running on Edge? Sure. Could they drop Edge support and immediately slaughter this benchmark? Possibly. But they're not doing that because they're focused on building a framework that allows for people to build real quality production software. I do want to talk more about what Jimmy's had to say, though. For those who don't know, Jimmy's the engineering manager on Next.js. Great dude. Again, Vercel is not paying me to say this at all. We have not talked about this whatsoever. This is my honest take on these things, but I wanted to read his response to the drama because I think it's pretty good. For those curious on why AppRouter looks worse on those benchmarks, I can offer a few technical reasons. First, a disclaimer. Benchmarks are good, but they never paint a whole picture. As I showed in, funny enough, you size me, as I showed in one of my tweets, a simple slow fetch totally derails the numbers and makes every framework look pretty much just as slow. This likely happens for 99% of your apps. If you're really concerned with raw throughput, then maybe look for a lower level backend framework. I do think Next has a lot more qualities to offer than raw performance. Yes. If you actually think these benchmarks matter, you should first off be making a lot of jokes about PHP because up until recently, PHP was hilariously slow and it went from hilariously slow to almost usable. <laughs> but if you care a lot about how many times your server can generate an HTML page, go write it in Go or Rust, maybe C or C++. But these numbers don't matter that much. That's why we don't normally talk about them. They just look bad in the screenshot and it makes the thing that we don't like easy to make fun of. But that's the only reason it's went viral is we wanna make fun of Next. <sighs> Sorry. On the raw performance, you can divide the time spent on a request roughly like this. The routing part is done by the Next router. The rendering is done by the React server component server. And the plumbing is done by Next to make sure the response gets piped and streamed correctly to the user. And if you don't think this part's necessary, might I remind you, when we last ran the benchmark, we don't get valid HTML back from the React. So if you want React on the server to generate valid HTML, it's a necessary step. The next routing part is common to both pages and app router. It is slower than it could be, but it's not a big bottleneck. We do have plans for a rewrite, but app router stability and DX comes first. Another important point, the amount of times that people, myself included, complain about instability in Next in the overall Next.js experience is huge. And it should be because when they make these huge changes and things break, it is infuriating and it makes people bounce off the framework. I've had my own frustrations. I had one recently, I'll even demo it quick. So I have this parallel route open. I have this text, it's not even blue anymore. I already changed it back to white. 
So I have to refresh to get that to persist. Now it shows that it's white. Now if I change this to text blue, save it, it worked that time. And that time it didn't because it's not in the bundle. <laughs> Do you see the point I'm trying to make? These are hard problems to solve. And previously, when I made these saves, it would just kick you to the other view. So it would be as though I refreshed here. And even funnier, when I was editing on this page, which I can do now, it would sometimes kick me back to the modal view. There are so many of these weird bugs that have existed in Next, not because Next is this evil, bad thing that's full of terrible engineering, rather because making a framework that does all the things Next does while providing a good DX is a difficult problem. And their priority is fixing these types of bugs so that we can benefit from the framework as much as possible. And overall, I think they've done a great job at that. I just want to emphasize the types of bugs that they're focused on solving aren't things people are going to be outraged about on Twitter, but they're much more important for the day-to-day -day experience using the framework. Like I didn't see anybody shouting at the mountaintops about how the parallel routing breaks hot module reloading, specifically when you're using uh, dash dash turbo, which, oh, that's probably why it wasn't breaking as hard as I expected. Yeah, you get the point. Fixing these painful small things might not get you a lot of clout on Twitter, but they're really important. And that's been the focus for the team for a while, not these unimportant benchmarks. I will say this has bit them a few times. Like the dev experience using Webpack with Next was unacceptably slow when App Router dropped. It was beyond frustrating. Having like changes you were making not appear in the browser until seconds later, like running out of memory was awful. And the reason they didn't focus on that was admittedly similar to this, where their focus was both making the best DX possible for App Router, as well as a bet on the long-term investment into Turbo Pack. They would have made Webpack faster if Turbo Pack was known to take as long as it was going to take, but they thought it would come out soon, so they focused on just making a good DX and letting Turbo Pack handle the rest. That's kind of what's happening here. The difference is it matters even less. So I'm a little concerned that the efforts of the next team making next the best experience possible are going to be sidetracked in a performance war around a number that doesn't actually matter that much. Yeah. So more info on why it's slow. For the server component rendering part, this is where things get a bit interesting. One reason why the performance is not one-to-one -one with a classic React SSR pass, as shown in the benchmark, is that you can think of it as an additive separate step. You render your server components, and then you SSR that, as well as the client code, to HTML, and you send it over. Today there's a bit of overhead in these two steps, but I know that Josh has some plans to overhaul and improve this in React land. Another bottleneck in NextPerf is that we use the WebStream implementation of the server components and SSR renderer, mostly because it was easier to share code between Node and Edge. This is, again, why I'm so annoyed, because they're making decisions to make Next much more flexible and powerful and, to be frank, nice to use even outside of Vercel. The fact that you can run Next on Edge runtime means you can run Next in Web Workers, which means you can run Next on something like Cloudflare. They could make this faster for Node, but by making it faster for Node, they would also be making it incompatible with Edge. Should they do that? I would hope everyone here would say no. There are a lot of stream operations during render in Next, and while some of the overhead is on us, I believe that the node web streams are not fully optimized yet, and there's some overhead when using them. I also love the ownership. While some of the overhead is on us, node web streams are not fully optimized. Yes. Something I actually tried, but I couldn't because getting all of the stuff set up properly was annoying and I might do it for a future video. So I wanted to actually try running Next on Edge Runtime locally to see what the performance difference looked like if there was one at all, just out of curiosity. My gut is that Node would be slightly better optimized still, but I was really curious and didn't have a chance to test that. Someone else does, let me know and I'll pin your comment. One thing we're exploring is potentially refactoring the whole pipeline to use Node streams instead, which are more battle tested. Fair. But again, web streams are standard Node streams aren't. It kind of sucks that Next's attempts to follow web standards are getting them shit here. Because if you guys remember, Next got so much shit for not following web standards. And then they started and nobody, nobody cared. There's another one of those things that falls in the bucket of stuff people don't really care about, like benchmarks or like lock-in, where they just say it so they have an excuse for not using the thing that they didn't want to use. And again, if you don't want to use Next, that's fine. But they went really hard adding web standards because people were complaining about it. Nobody cared. And now I'm scared they might go really hard trying to fix the performance stuff here and no one will care. But part of why they're having the performance issue in the first place is they're using web standards instead of node standards. Whew. Yeah. So again, they could make it so they're not following standards and it would be slightly faster, similar to how the React example we just saw. Again, I hate to keep doing this, but I really want to emphasize serving a non HTML wrapped stream of TRs and TDs is not following web standards. This is a dump of elements that aren't even part of a like HTML document. This is not a meaningful comparison of anything. And pretending it is, is a fundamental misunderstanding of web standards and the web as a whole. So yes, if you're just spitting out 
malformatted HTML, you can make something faster than next. And if you make something that doesn't follow web standards, you can also make something faster than next. But if you want to have a good experience, both for the developers and for the users, I still truly believe Next is making incredible compromises. And until I see other solutions that offer the same functionality, both for devs and importantly for users, it's hard for me to care. Like it just, this isn't where your bottlenecks are. If you built a service where you're bottlenecked primarily by the amount of time it takes for the server to generate the HTML, rewrite it and go. Totally cool with that. But none of us are actually bottlenecked on this. Otherwise, Evan Yu wouldn't have found a 2x win. Nobody cares. This isn't a real number that means much of anything beyond a thing for framework nerds to micro-optimize for fun. And like, if this never escaped the circle of framework people, if Evan just like quietly did this because he discovered that, cool. But the fact that every framework author is effectively being pressured into optimizing this number that doesn't matter, that's incredibly frustrating to me. And that's why I took the time to sit down, play with these benchmarks and make this video. I wanna run this once or twice more before we wrap up because I'm just curious if I can consistently see the much better numbers now that I have the concurrency enabled. I might have it running 400. It should take a minute, but not too long. Rerun, moving, removing the delay, yeah, I can do that. Wait for that to run. Maybe you shouldn't have had it run 400 times. <laughs> and that's pretty consistent. Yeah, that's actually really consistent. I was expecting the numbers to be a, a bigger gap there. But it turns out when you run things concurrently, which is how we actually deal with network requests, that the performance on these things is a lot closer than it was before too. So let's change uh, per request the test data to not be 100 milliseconds. Um, I should probably switch this back to the original code. Let me do that slow, drop this guy instead. I have to rebuild. This is why I want to have Turbo Pack because it'll make these steps a little bit faster. Cool. Now we're not actually blocking. We'll see how fast it is. Just with the concurrency of five. I'm down to just 9.5 times slower with the concurrency enabled. Interesting that Remix is so fast as soon as you can run multiple tasks at once. Like I did not expect Remix to suddenly be like a champ. What is the Remix one even serving? Is it also doing the malformatted HTML thing? No, it's not. It's properly formatted HTML. Oh, Remix is using defer. So it's not blocking on render to string. That makes sense. Yeah, I did not expect these numbers to be so much better simply by running them concurrently. In the end, I hope you guys understand how little these benchmarks matter for most developers. They are really cool for us to nerd out about on the framework side, but sometimes our nerdiness spreads too far and people misread the stuff that we're talking about. So if you're using these benchmarks to pick your framework, you're using them wrong. If you're using these benchmarks to make your framework perform better, cool, have fun with it. If you're using these frameworks to shame others for their technical decisions, you should feel bad about yourself because that is never the right way to go about these things. Otherwise, again, we'd all just be making fun of PHP because it has been the slowest solution on the server for a long time. Anyways, until next time, peace nerds.